Deep Voice here, and today I'll be showing you my new Viking shield. As you can see, I made a Viking shield using a Victorian era fabric called Jacquard. Now, this is my first attempt. I used Baltic birch plywood. I think I used 3 8 possibly 5 8 inch thick plywood. I'm pretty sure it's the 3 8 and, and for the rim, I went to Canadian Tire and I found a gas pipe or piping that they use for natural gas and it seemed to work pretty well. You just simply, and actually it's pretty strong. You see how it glues like that? Well, it's, it's actually not, it's not glued, but it actually it's, it's natural elasticity keeps it on. It's quite unique. As for the metal boss, I bought it online. Here is the back of my Viking shield. I, to, to make the handle, I made it a bit wider and also made out of solid oak for additional strength. To install the handle to the main body of the shield, I used wooden dowels or, or these wooden pegs to install, to install it. It's a very, very solid construction. I also used epoxy glue to glue the handle on. And actually I used slightly longer screws on this side to, to actually help connect the handle to the main shield. So this is a very, very strong construction. Even though it's just a wall hanger, I wanted to make the last. And as you can see, I'm very impressed with the results. <laughs> okay. And before I started the Viking Shield, I did a lot of experimentation. I wanted to find out if you were to glue fabric onto wood, then took another piece of wood, glued that onto here, would it hold? As you can see, it does hold very, very well. Even though, so you got wood, the fabric glued on, then a piece of wood glued onto on top. So yes, even with the fabric in between, it will hold, and as you can see, the bond is actually quite strong. Here is a German Swihander sword that I built. As you can see, this is truly a late Renaissance sword. And man, I have to say, this is a unique weapon to train with. I mean, the German, this particular German sword, has a second cross guard called, I'm mispronouncing it, Perry Hacken. But anyways, it is an amazing, amazing thing to train with. It's made of solid maple. I believe I put, uh, I used uh, bird's eye maple for the uh, counterweight, the pommel. Here's another European weapon that I built. It's called a Felks. It wasn't very popular, and it kind of went, went on popular very early on, and it was probably replaced by great swords. It's essentially it's a long-handled felchion. I used purple hardwood, and I, if I remember correctly, I used a smoke ebony stain on it. Here is a sword that is used by the Thessalonians and Dracians. Now the Dracians too call this a felx, which is interesting. But what makes this weapon very peculiar for the uh, Thessalonians? The blades, there would usually be some variation. The blade would either be about 50% blade, 50% handle, or about a 60-40% ratio, but there were many variations. Um, it's not a long handled saber by any means. It actually was sharpened on the inside, on this side, the side that curves inwards. And what's also very peculiar is this particular hole. There's a lot of debate on just how it would use, but I don't think there's any conclusive argument just how and what it was used for. Some, there's some suggestion to install a cross guard, but if you look at the uh, artwork on some surviving um, pottery, it didn't really have a cross guard except for this. Others say, well, maybe they didn't invent the scabbard yet. Well, that's false because they had the scabbard for the copes and other swords, so why... So that kind of rules out that possibility as well. 
And that's actually a, that should actually make a very good debate. Just what is this hole used for? This, and look, just look online the Thessalonian weapons, and look for some archaeological evidence, and you'll see this. This here is a cookery I haven't quite finished making yet. The cookery is used by the Gurkhas of Nepal, and like I say, I'm very impressed with it. Unfortunately, I dropped it and broke it, so I'm kind of in the process of fixing it. But yeah, it's a little bit more stylish. Here is the felchion that I built. I saw a drawing on this in a book that I have, and I thought it was a pretty unique looking felchion. And I'm guessing it was designed to counter armor. As you can see, it has an extreme hatchet point. And like I say, it's, it's not the most agile thing by any means, it's, I think it's self-evident. But just the brutal power that this thing would probably would have generated. And my best guess would be to counter armor. I mean, that's why you probably have such a brutal design. Needless to say, this is a very orcish looking sword. <laughs> Here is a short pole axe that I built. Very late period. Here's the Viking Axe I made. I probably recognize it from one of my other Viking videos. This particular piece is made of solid oak. As you can see, this particular axe has really stood the test of time. Here's a Thessalonian shield that I built. I was wondering, how do I take normal plywood and make it look like African zebra wood? Here's the trick. I first stained the plywood with a smoked ebony stain. Then I sand it off. Now these, the grain of the wood absorbs more of the stain. Then after, after this process is done, I use Danish walnut oil that's been polymerized or boiled and covered it to get this nice thick golden look to it. Usually about three coats of the Danish walnut oil will do the trick. And for the back, you see there's nothing particularly fancy. I just used some leather. It's one of my older pieces, so I was still teaching myself at the time. But like I said, I'm very impressed with the, turning this plain old plywood into a very exotic looking zebra wood using this particular technique. Here is a Japanese war club that I built. I built it for my upcoming zombie film. I even built the stand too. Now I use solid oak, two planks. Once again, using the Danish walnut oil. I uh, glued the two planks together and used um, upholstery nails you can get at Tandy Leather. All in all, I'm very impressed with this particular piece. Here is the stand by itself. Here is one of my most favorite swords of all time, and now I'm trying the great fought with this. It's called a copus. And if you look at it, it's basically, think of it, a giant cookery blade. That's the best way to describe it. It's sharpened along the, on here. It has an extreme hatchet point, so it's extremely powerful. And much like the, and very much like the saber, it's actually, you can actually hook around weapons and hook around shields very, very well, which I'll demonstrate in a bit. And 
And as you can see, oak can actually hold an edge. Next, using Alexander the Great's preferred sword, the Kulpis, I'll show you how it might have been used. It might have been held like in a saber, similar to the saber grip, and the Kulpis had many similar properties to the late period saber in its ability to reach around shields. And in hacking motion, do you see how it can reach around and striking the user behind it? Or in a thrusting motion, it can glance off the rim and it can simply reach over. The curvature of the blade makes this thing absolutely lethal. 